Welcome to another episode of You Can't Handle the Emet podcast, the show that is put together to introduce you to ordinary people living extraordinary lives. My name is Nicholas Ingle. I'm the host of your show. I've been sober for 13 years. I'm an alcoholic. And the lessons and experiences that I've gained in recovery and trying to build my life I'm wanting to share with you here, and we also bring on some amazing people to share their incredible stories. Our guest today is a very awesome guy, James Starkey. James is a veteran. James is also in recovery, and he's also here today to talk about his experiences in life, in recovery, his military service, PTSD, and something that I'm really excited about and, and how we got James here the book that he's writing that'll be out in November to coincide with his 10 years in sobriety. So James, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Nick. Good to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. No, it's absolutely awesome. You are my first author. So, well, second author. The, my, my first one was uh, Nick Skipworth Mitchell. If you saw Jesus, Nicky will murder me. Shame the poor. So Nick was in the RLI, the Rhodesian Light Infantry. And uh, he lost his leg to cancer just after he began his service and carried out his service as a medic, which was quite cool. So uh, Jeff- right. Look, I, I don't consider myself quite an author. Um, I've never had any experience in book writing before, but it's been on my heart for many, many years to do this. And all I did was the content. I just put it down and I've got the professionals to do the rest, thankfully. Um, it's like I said, it was a goal I had for quite a few years. And then when this lockdown happened, I decided I must do something productive. I can't sit around all day doing nothing. So I decided it was a perfect time to write my book. And it, it kept me busy for many weeks and kept me productive and, and sane. Okay, that's fantastic. Can you give us a little bit of an idea about what the book is about? The book is basically my life story from pretty much when I was born until now. Um, so the book is about. My upbringing, you know, I had a very violent upbringing uh, at home. My mom was very abusive, a very, very angry woman. She was sadly beaten and abused by her dad, who also was a veteran in the First and Second World War. He was a very aggressive and violent man. He, he hurt her, he hurt her sisters and her brothers. Um, he, she lived in fear of this man. Unfortunately, she became him. And then when my dad left when I was very, very young, she sort of started behaving like her dad and she used to start giving me beatings. One of my earliest memories was being beaten with a rubber hose because I spilled bath water on the floor when I was about five or six years old. So that kind of thing sat with me, you know, it was my caregiver, my only caregiver. And for me, the world had turned on me. I didn't have a safe space. Um, I had a very weak character as a result of these kinds of beatings. And what also happened, I think because I had a weak character, when I went, when I went to school, I got bullied a lot. I got bullied a hell of a lot. It didn't matter that I was quite a tall guy. I wasn't big like I am now, but everywhere I went, I couldn't make eye contact with anybody. I had a very low self-esteem and I seemed to get picked on. You know, the guys made me eat stones and rotten sandwiches and beat me up. And, you know, I've had my nose broken at school. I've had my jaw broken. Uh, I had my ribs broken at school functions. I've just, you know, uh, as far as bullying goes, it destroyed me. Uh, I had no safe space anywhere. So at home, I was scared to go home and I was scared to walk into the school gates and I was scared to leave the school gates. I had no safe space anywhere. This world was really, really a cool place for me. And that sort of scarred me for life. Um, but as I grew up, you know, primary school for me wasn't really that bad because I was a quite a good kid. I had this fear. In those days, I went to a sort of English Afrikaans primary school and they put the fear of God into you literally. and that fear was that if you do something wrong, you're going to end up held as a guy with a big stick and it's going to, it's going to hurt you with it. And I didn't do anything wrong. Um, I was a straight A student through primary school, funny enough, even with my trauma. I, um, I did well. I played a bit of chess. I didn't, you know, and I played a bit of sport. I was quite good at soccer and stuff. And I just didn't generally do anything wrong. But I was quite broken and meek inside. Uh, when I came to high school, my first year in high school, um, I found drugs and alcohol. And for me, because I had this fear inside me that I described to you, um, it's horrible to live in that fear. Fear of waking up in the morning, fear of who's coming into your room, fear of the guys at school. And as soon as I found alcohol and drugs, I started with marijuana. Uh, you know, at school, we didn't have all the fancy designer drugs they'd get. 
But as soon as I used or I drank, it was the most amazing feeling for me back then because I found that I, I thought I had the answer to all my problems because the feeling inside me, all those horrible feelings of fear used to disappear. I used to feel like an amazing, I could express myself. I wasn't scared to have a conversation. I could express myself. I wasn't scared of being beaten up. And the feelings that the product used to give me was, was second to none. Should I just keep going? As we yeah, absolutely, 100%. Jump in, if you jump in, I'll yeah, just keep absolutely. going. Absolutely, for sure. Um, so it really, really was like a magic pull for me and the answer to all my problems, I thought. You know, but as I say, drinking and drugs is fun. Fun with problems and then just problems. So having started when I was 13, I hung around with all the, the guys that would use. And in those days, drug addiction wasn't very big. Um, I used to use inhalants after school, petrol, thinners, anything I could get my hands on, glue, because I didn't always have money. I couldn't get drunk in the afternoons after school because I'd get caught by my parents because it's quite obvious when you're drunk. So I used, I used to smoke a lot of weed and then use the inhalants. Um, and I pretty much got out of it every single day. I didn't feel good anymore. I was just hiding from the world and the pain. And it was when I was about 14 years, well, 13 years old, I actually ran away from home. I stole a firearm uh, that I've, my mom had in her cupboard. Um, I stole that, I ran away from home. I got a friend from school to run away with me because I knew he had problems too. And we ended up running away. He took the firearm away from me because of the hatred I had for my mom. I wanted to use it on it before I left, you know, and it's a horrible thing mm. to say, but that's exactly how my brain was. And, um, yeah, my, my aim was to shoot too, but he stopped me, he took the gun away. We ran away, we got caught, obviously. We were going, we were going to Sun City, and we were going to go and become lifeguards because we thought we could lie about our age. You know, at 13, we, we just had no clue. We had no money. And there were 12 rand or something like that. It was stupid. Got caught. They put us in jail. Um, you know, it was the first time I went to jail. They put me in with the adults eventually. Um, him and I were in the same cell together. Um, there was something wrong with him. He's now in jail for murder. Um, he killed a prostitute. Um, he was really, really psychopathic. Not that I was normal, but this guy was way worse than me. He tried to kill me in a cell with a perm comb. You know those combs you use? Your hair. He tried to push it through my throat and we, he got caught. And for my safety, they put me in with the adults, which at 13 wasn't really a... It was scary. It really was. Yeah, you know? It's not a safe place. But, well, I was. I never got hurt. I never got raped. I never got hurt. I never. Uh, fortunately for me, um, none of those things. I didn't experience any of that. Just the fear that you know you would get locked up with all these drunk men. Um, then I came out, but I never changed my ways. Um, I despised my mom. I didn't get on with anybody. I hated adults. I. Um, got moved when I was about 14. My dad's wife, my stepmother had said, if I ever want to go stay with them, and that was the Kensington, Melbourne side of Joburg, um, I, I was welcome. And I said, no, I'd love to come and stay with you, please. I can't, I can't take this anymore. And I moved across there. And the guys from that neighborhood suited my behavior 100%. It was a bit rougher than where I was from in Randburg. Um, we started doing the trucks every day. We would steal car radios, we'd steal bikes, we'd steal anything we could get our hands on just to go to uh, the pawn shops in, in Jewel Street to go sell what we've started, just to keep our habit going. And this was in Standard 7, Standard 8, Standard 9. Um, so that's quite a big thing for a, for a kid to be doing. Um, I, I stole from my girlfriend's house when they weren't there. I stole their half on their TV. And um, this kind of thing became normality. But these guys that I hung around with, we had a little... And we were a junior club for a biker club called the Blood Brothers. And this was pretty cool because there must have been 25 of us. You know, there's a whole little clan of us. So when we went out at 16 and 17, I had all these friends. And I was safe and I was protected. And I felt like I belonged for the first time in my life. And um, I had a family. And I wasn't so scared when I went out. Besides the fact that I was using, I had a gang of guys. Man, and these guys were connected. So I felt good and safe for the first time in my life. I was still very tense inside, um, but we used, we drank, we dived, we, we duck and dived, we stole. This was our existence every single day. A lot of those guys are now either dead or in jail permanently or have been released already. Um, and this was that, those were my school years. I went to six high schools and I finished in standard eight. I didn't get a standard nine on the trip. Um, so it just shows you, you know, I couldn't. I was using drugs at school. I was smoking during breaks, smoking weed. And at some stages, even buttons and mandrakes. 
So I dropped out of school, and as you know, in those days, or some guys, the, the, the viewers and listeners may not know, we were conscripted to the army, to the old South African Defence Force. So we had to go to the army. Now at that stage, I was living very close to Hillbrow. I was waking up at four o'clock in the afternoon, going into Hillbrow for the night, coming back at five o'clock in the morning and repeating that cycle. That's all I used to do. And now the army came and got me, unfortunately, and they wanted me to wake up at the same time I used to go to bed, which wasn't very, it wasn't very cool for me. And um, yeah, that change was the first time I ever had, uh, this time I was part of a healthy team, not like the team I was part of before. Those guys that I'd, the little gang that I had when I was a teenager, they weren't my friends, they were my accomplices. These guys that I got together with in the army, they became my brothers. We were in it together, we went through a lot of hell, times were tough, and they push you to your limits, but you carry each other through this thing, and it taught me teamwork, um, it taught me friendship, it taught me how to stick together through the, with guys, no matter where they're from, through thick and thin. The, the brothers in arms things like you see on TV is, is absolutely amazing. It gave me something to work for. I did well in the academic side of it, in, in the lecture side. I got a little bit of rank. I went on a crew commander's course. And I actually excelled. As a soldier, I did. I was a very, very good soldier, if I may say so myself. And for once, I actually had achieved something. However, that was great. Army training, I think, is great for any single man in this country. Um, for the discipline, for the routine, everything, for the structure that it offers you. Um, teaches you to push yourself to your limits. It's absolutely amazing. However, I, I, after that, at the end of my first year, I was one of the unlucky guys who ended up in the middle of Angola when the Cubans were there trying to take over southern Angola against UNITA, and UNITA were trying to get a stronghold in southern Angola. Uh, the Americans were helping UNITA, the rebels. We were going to help UNITA uh, against the Cubans and the MPLA and, and FAPLA, and some of them, they had a whole lot of Russian equipment up there. They were tens of thousands of troops there from Cuba. And most people go to the border and they don't get to see this kind of thing. We were about 400 kilometers over the border. And, you know. And, and, and that's, quite, yeah, that's quite a big difference with guys saying they're going to the border. It's, yeah. you're, you're seeing action north of the, very north of the border. You know, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. I've got, um, as a matter of fact, if you can see behind me, there's three mm. medals there. Yes, and the, the one is the one is for general service, the one is for border duty, pro patria, which is border duty, and then the one is a very special medal which you get for operating outside the country's border, which is a medal that most people don't get um, very often. And my ego comes to play here. People hear my story, which I'm about to tell, and about the war and how terrible it was. So, oh, no, you must know my brother; he was on the border. And my ego says, you know. Mm. I wasn't on the border. We did some terrifying things, and I almost want this credit because my ego just won't let go. Mm. Um, and so, anyway, we ended up in Angola. We were told we were going for just, uh, two weeks in Operation Hooper. Two weeks turned into nearly six months. They kept telling us we were going home. We had beards as long as yours. Mm. You know, my hair was long. Um, it was very long. I, I didn't have a haircut for six months. Um, we didn't have shaving cream, soap, shampoo, until, you know, as ours ran out. Um, you know, we stink. We had flies all over us. But that was the least of my worries. You know, that's fine. That's, that's glorified or, or just not so glorified camping. But having to face enemies and having to face death on so many levels, you know, when you've got a hand in somebody else's demise, it's not like in the movies. It's not cool. You know, these guys all say to me, I wish I was in the army and I wish I did that. must be fun. It's not fun. You don't mm. want to, even though the guy is, they tell you it's your enemy. You know, taking someone's life is not a lack of thing. It's not a nice thing to deal with after. Fearing for your own life is also another thing. Um, somebody compared my PTSD to a medic's PTSD the other day, and also my ego got a bit bruised because, you know, no one's trying to kill the medic. Yeah. It's a very good thing. We see the same things. Um, so, um, you know, the things I saw, I, was, I turned 19 in Nanko. I saw things. I mean, the, the fights that we used to have, there were thousands against thousands. You know, it was tanks against tanks, aeroplanes, artillery, um, everything. It was the biggest battles on South African soil since the Second World War. Um, I'm not going to go into the gory detail and tell you about the blood and guts, but believe me, the, 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 so, some of the guys didn't go home looking like they did when they left. You know, yeah. uh, Some vehicles had got hit. The body bags were just filled with general parts because we couldn't tell one guy from another. 
Yeah. It was absolutely horrendous. It's stuff that I don't wish on anybody, especially a 19-year-old teenager, you know. And so I sat there for six months. Um, I acquired severe post-traumatic stress disorder. I was scared of everything. When the wind picked up a little bit too much there, it sounded slightly like an airplane. I'd hit the deck. I had, I was a nervous wreck and I was no war hero. Um, I don't think there were any of us were heroes. We were scared. We were very, very scared. Um, like I said, it's not like in the movies. It really, really isn't. Um, so after that, we were sent back to Civil Street, Civilization. We weren't given debriefing and weren't given counseling, but we all battled with PTSD. Um, I couldn't fit into society again. The only guys I'd hang around with were guys that had been in Angola with me. Not border guys, guys that had been in Angola with me. I used, we drank. A lot of the guys turned to the bottle. Um, and like I said, I just didn't feel like I fitted in anymore. I got a job after the army and I was very good at it, um, which was a surprise. However, I think because of the army um routine and regulations and how strict they were and getting things done and using that kind of stuff uh, those kind of skills i got good at my job i was drinking at night but i got to work on time and i did my job very well and then i drink again um at night i didn't drink every single night but when i did you see when i drink i'm not like the average guy who'll go home and have two beers and, and, and stop and then have his dinner as soon as i start i can't stop i'm sure you can relate you mean absolutely yeah <laughs> And um, there's no off switch. As they say in the program that I'm in now, one is too many and a thousand is never enough. That's so it. My, just, but about I used this, I was medicating my problem with more of a problem. Um, I was battling. The thing is now, at this stage, I started becoming very angry and I started becoming violent. Now I was quite anxious and angry before I went to the army. But now after all of this, I became a monster, you know. Um, which I'll describe now. As much as I, I said I hated my mother before, when I opened my mouth, my mother used to come out, that emotional abuse. People would upset me, small little things like this, and the, I would spit blood. You know, I would, if somebody gave me bad service or was rude to me in a shop, I'd tear the shop apart. Restaurant tables would go fly. My road rage was out of this world. I probably got out of my car three times a week. It's just, and I thought this was normal. I thought everybody did it. Um, I was in trouble with the law all the time because I was always in fights. Um, I had no, again, no off switch for the alcohol, but I had no off switch for the violence. There was no count to 10. I didn't know how to do that. I wasn't capable of doing that. I got married. I got married a couple of times. I don't know all the details there, but um, I used to, if things weren't going my way and I didn't have control of my day, I would lose it. I need people to read my mind. I need everything to be like it is in the military. I need to basically, as I say, I, I, I need to direct a play and everyone mm. must do what I say they must do and then life will work for me. If they don't, and life doesn't do this, believe me. Guys come in front of you and they do it, and I would totally lose my cool. Um, I'd been arrested many, many times for my violent behavior. I was lucky I got away with what I got away with. Um, I realized after a few years that I've got this PTSD thing, you know, and I know I have it from childhood, I have it from the bullying, I have it from my mom, and I have it from the army. But because the army is still in town, I went off to one military hospital in, in Pretoria and I said to them, Look, guys, you, you, you've messed me up a little bit. Yeah, I think mm. you need to take the responsibility and I'd like you to fix me, please. Right. Um, so, Anyway, they said, sure. And even though it was the new government thing, they welcomed me and it was quite surprising. Right. Hmm. And they said, I mean, we see you've got a problem. Um, they gave me a psychologist. The psychologist said to me, let's chat. We had a chat, filled in some forms. They put me on medication. And I thought that the counseling wasn't great. I must admit that it, it didn't help me at all. But they put me on meds, anti-anxiety, anti-depression, anti-psychotic, anti-everything. I appeared before a board, a whole panel there of guys that um, had to assess me and see if I had a problem. And by the time they finished speaking to me, they said, we definitely got a problem. I started getting checks in the post in those days. I still get 2,000 something around a month as a disability pension. Right. Uh, those days, I didn't like that because it meant I was mentally handicapped. I didn't, 
uh, like the label too much. Now I manage it well. Um, so they kind of helped me. I took these tablets for a couple of years and I drank. I didn't feel any better. When I stopped taking the tablets, I used to get withdrawals and have to take them again. And about two, three years later, the, a colonel there who was a psychiatrist when I went for to get my repeat script, he said to me, Starkia, how are you not drinking on these tablets? So I didn't want to tell him I'm an alcoholic because I didn't think I was there. But I said, yeah, sir, look, I'm having one or two. He said, you're gone, you know. Um, I wasn't going to tell him I was having one or two cases. Yeah. He said, you can't use, you can't use alcohol and, and these um, tablets at the same time. It's like driving your car with your foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. One's doing one job, one's counteracting, and your engine's going to blow. And you're going to have serious consequences, boy. You need to do something. So I did. I stopped the tablets. Right. Like, no, there was no way I was stopping them. No, I mean, no, no. Just, <laughs> I, I'm not an yeah. alcoholic. I enjoy my, my, my drinks. And I, I stopped the tablets. But then I got withdrawal symptoms from my tablets, and I took the tablets again. And I just carried on. I didn't get better. I didn't want to get better. I was in fights. I was a nightmare to my family. Um, they didn't know who's coming through the door. You know, is the door going to get kicked open, slammed open? Um, yeah. I, how, how were you feeling towards yourself at that time? I mean, in terms of self-love, self-care? No, I hated myself. I, I didn't want to live. Um, I had a death wish. I wanted to die. Um, I wasn't suicidal per se, but I'd get into situations where people would pull guns on knives and not work. I didn't care about my own yeah. mortality. But I, I, I think I had a death wish. Um, my plan was to stay alive until my kids were old enough and then I was going to kill myself. That was when they didn't need me anymore. So I still had some form of responsibility where I thought I'd stick around, look after my kids, and then um, I actually had an arrangement with my sister-in-law that was about my plan. Right. Um, and so my, I was self-hate. I, I didn't like myself. I didn't like how I felt. I was full of anger. I was full of rage. No love. There was no compassion. There was no love. No serenity, no spirituality at all. Um, so, anyway, my behavior just got worse. It got worse mm -hmm. and worse. I got into trouble. I was always in the nightclubs. I was never home. My poor wife. And when I was home, I was a nightmare. They didn't know who was coming through mm -hmm. the door. Am I going to scream? Am I going to shout? And one day I'm nice, one day I'm not. I'm nice for two seconds, and then they just trigger me, you know, and then I blow again. I, 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 was a, I wasn't a very nice human being. Um, I can't blame anybody else for my condition, although there were underlying circumstances. My behavior is still my behavior, and I still need to take responsibility for that, which, which I might have. I um, got into trouble again. Uh, this time, some various trouble, some serious trouble. Um, as a result of that, somebody was very badly harmed, and um, the police were looking for me. They had my little identity kit, you know, the police sketches in the yeah. newspapers. And um, there was a whole lot of some serious looking guys also trying to get hold of me. So I decided, told my wife, look, I heard now's place a nice place to live. You know, we'll just go start it freshly, mm -hmm. take the kid there. I had two kids at that stage. Go back to, go to now's place, start it fresh. You know, they know they call this in Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous a geographical. Yeah. So we're going to go start from scratch somewhere else and things will be better. And it's an idea that just pops into your head and you go, yep, right, let's do it. No planning. Yeah, I'm good. We go, yeah. And we're manipulators. You know, I manipulated my wife into thinking that we're going for the meantime, I was running away from my problems. Yes. So the only problem with going to Nelspreit was when I got to Nelspreit, I was there. Yeah. And I did exactly the same thing there. And I lived there for five years and I got into trouble there for five years. I had two attempted murder charges against me in about three months. I managed to get off all the charges because we would intimidate or manipulate or pay somebody off or lose a file. And I did some horrendous things. And five years into my time in Nelspreit, I had to leave Nelspreit for the same reason that I left Joburg. And I ran away from Nelspreit back to Joburg. But being five years later, I was, I was pretty safe. I uh, came back here. My behavior just continued. Again, and it just got worse and worse. So one night, uh, I hadn't slept for a couple of days, and I bumped into an ex at a dodgy Nigerian jaw, and, and I lost my cool for whatever it is, just because I could. Uh, no real rhyme or reason. I became very aggressive. I tore this place apart, and 
and people arrived. It, it was just horrible. I thought I was going to die. I was homicidal. I was suicidal. I wanted to die. I wanted to take everybody with me. That was my other plan when I was in Nelspruit, when I was going to kill myself. It would be unfair to leave my kids behind because if I leave my kids behind, it's not fair. And this world is cruel for them too. So my sick plan was, if I go, I'm taking them all with me. And this night, I was just, I didn't want to uh, add that death wish thing. And you, you, yeah. So you're thinking this from a place of, of love, as it were, like as their dad, because you just yeah. know this world is pain and you don't want to leave them here. Yeah, I mean, what kind of thinking is that? I didn't ask them if they don't mm -hmm. like it. Yeah? I decided for them that this is a cruel place to grow up and they can't do it without me. So we've all got to go. I mean, the, the yeah. thinking, my mindset was just, it, it was just, it was ridiculous. Um, so I, that same day when I had that little meltdown, fortunately, my ex-wife put me in a car. She took me back to one non-military hospital, said, do something with him. You guys are treating him, take him in. They took me in. They didn't even fill in forms. I was so bad. I went straight into a bed. I got an injection and had like a tranquilizing injection. Mm. Stayed there and didn't want to get better. But now I had to hide from some guys again. And... The counselling didn't help. I didn't tell them because it was always somebody else's fault. It was never my fault. I never admitted to anything. I blamed everybody for where I was. So I never got better. Stayed there for a while. Wouldn't speak to the You know who they have in the one mole psychiatric wards? Because they're not big into PTSD now with the new thing. There's not a lot of yeah. fighting going on. They have the addicts, of the, the, the kids of the soldiers that are addicts. So mm. they put me in a ward full of addicts. I said, I don't want to be here with addicts. I'm a soldier, my friend. I've got PTSD. I'm special. I'm not an addict. Yeah. So I didn't want to associate with them because I looked down on them. Meantime, I'd gone in there after a two-day two binge. Right. And um, I wouldn't speak to any of them except one little guy came and he spoke to me and he said, look, you look like you've got a big up in your train and everything. Can you maybe, there's a hospital gym there. And when I was off suicide watch, they let me uh, go and train there. He said, can't you take me for a day or two and just show me what to do? I want to try to get my life together and get something positive going. So, I was quite excited. I sat that night, I took an exam pad, I wrote mm -hmm. a page program for him, went to fetch him the next morning and he was dead. He, he killed himself that night because, and yet he, he was so excited when I left him. It just shows you the mindset and how quickly we can switch. He, um, he had everything to look forward to. He was fighting the same battles as me. And, you know, looking back, there could have been either one of us. And that day I cried and I never cried. I don't, I didn't have feeling in me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just glad that back then, I didn't make permanent decisions based on those temporary emotions like he did. Yeah. And it's the same that sticks with me now. Um, because that is, that's so time, true, huh? And so that's why, don't make, yeah. You know, suicide is a, is a permanent uh, solution to a temporary problem. I like that, mm -hmm. yeah. That is true. And I mean, all those crises that I've ever had are gone mm -hmm. now. Every right. crisis is at an expiry date. Um, if I might have had problems two years ago. They might have been this big. I can't even remember what the issue was. Now, but yeah. always passes. But I know this. Now. So after the hospital, I went. I just, I just carried on and on and on. And um, eventually, somehow, somewhere, I managed to get into recovery. I'd given up drinking a hundred times and drugging a hundred times. So what I do, I go to the bar and I have a Coca Cola. Yes. Yeah. But I wouldn't give up the environment. Yeah, I bumped into a friend of mine who was a track addict and ran a, a recovering track addict and ran a halfway house. And I used to go there for coffee, and I hadn't drank for three days because I'd given up again. And I mm. went to his, I went to his house for my coffee before I was going to the bar for my apple tars or coke. And I said to him, oh, "By the way, boy, I gave up drinking this week." And he says, "Yeah, oh, whatever. You think you have?" And I felt patronised. I said, mm. "But I'm telling you, I'm not asking you." Mm. And he said, "Judge, you're my friend. I'm going to tell you like it is." Can I have three minutes? I said, yes, go for it. He said, you've tried to stop before, but you go to the pub, you drink mm. a Coke, you drink an apple tar. So he had it. He knew exactly what I was doing. And then, you know what, you had a hard week. Then you just had a light beer. The next thing you had a normal beer. Next thing you had a bottle of brandy. You Next thing you're doing lines. And he knew me so well. I thought he'd been talking to my ex-wife behind my back. Yeah. Because he got me to a T. I didn't realize that this is just all us. <laughs> it's all of us. Right? Yep. <laughs> I didn't know. That was my first experience. I just thought this guy was a genius. Yeah. And he called me out and he said, look, you need to go to meetings and you need to do this. And I couldn't go into a program. I didn't have money. Mm. Um, 
when I cleaned up, I had two bags of clothing. I had to move out of my ex's house because um, we were sharing the house together, but she continued to drink. I couldn't be around it. Okay, because like sure. I said, you know, when I wanted to clean up, if you're in a barber shop, you'll have a haircut. Just don't go to the bar. Yeah. And That's since it. that day, nine mm. and a half years ago, I don't go to bars. I went to the bar last year to watch the final of the Springboks in the World Cup. Mm-hmm. I took my sponsor, who's 40 years sober, and his sober wife with me to go and have a look. I was safe. But as a rule, I apply that barbershop story. Um, and he pointed me on the right track. And I started going to meetings. But because I didn't have a counselor, someone explaining this all to me i thought i'll do it my way mm-hmm. i didn't have a sponsor yet so i yeah. used to sit in these meetings and listen to the steps and think oh, that's for the other guys you know that's for the other guys and um, no I'll, do I'll just come because in in these meetings what they do you have a person sharing almost like i'm doing now and yeah. they tell you their life story and then it's a happy ending it's like a rocky movie you know yeah. the underdog rules and i used to call it story not i loved it Mm. All these broken people are now recovering and they're living and it was like, it was an inspirational movie kind of thing for me and I just kept going back. And I wasn't welcomed when I got there like a lot of people are, open right. arms and that. I, I always wondered because in the other people's shares they said oh, it's the most warm welcome I've ever had. Yes. But about a year later they told me that I was scary and they were too scared to speak to me. So right. um, I forgave them. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So mm. I started going to meetings and then about three, four months in, because I wasn't doing steps, I wasn't doing anything I was supposed to, because I'm special. Yeah. You know, and I was heading, probably heading for a relapse. I was staying away from the pub. But then one of the guys, when he shared, well, one thing that came out of his mouth, he said, if you take a horse thief's liquor away, you've got a sober horse thief. And that made sense to me. I thought, right. you know what? I, I'm that guy. I'm still angry. I'm still violent. I'm just not in as much trouble as I used to be because I'm hanging around better people instead of toxic people. Um, I'm still doing all the things that I used to before. I've got to stay away from my old behavior or nothing's going to change. Yes. And I'll eventually, I'll eventually drink again. And I took that and, and I started working the program and I started working the steps. And for those who don't know, which most people on this format probably don't, but it's a 12-step program in A and AA. And of those 12 steps, it's only step one that mentions the product. So that's sort of 8% of the program is about the product. Yep. The other 11 steps um, are about me fixing me, fixing that sober horse thief inside me, fixing that idiot inside me that's violent, fixing the guy that's resentful, fixing all those problems. I mean, um, somehow, somewhere, through this whole process and through the steps, I don't get out the car anymore. You know, when there's a road rage incident, I still get crossed every now and again, but I think maybe one in 10 instead of every single time. Right. I don't see the small stuff. Somehow this program just started, started working miracles in my life. Nobody wanted to date me. Nobody wanted to be with me. I asked my son, because I had a problem with girls as well. I used to say you all day. Right. And I love Eric because that also fills that void inside you. You get the little yeah. hearts in the morning on your WhatsApp and SMS. So I asked my son about this one, about a woman once. And he said, Dad, seriously, would you date you? And, you know, we found that quite funny at the time. But I actually use that in my recovery. Um, yes. Would I date me? You know, I have good values. I have good morals. I do the right thing. And I think I have started, I have become a person that I probably would, well, I've, I've, I got married last year. Um, and I got married to, for lack of a better word, a nerd. Someone who's right. never snuck out of the house at night. Someone who hasn't got any clue about my background. She's never had a cigarette. Um, she used to have a drink a month, a flying fish. It wasn't even a product she was drinking. And she, she could drink that and, and, and over four hours. She wouldn't even finish it. Right. And she doesn't understand my world. She's from a nice, solid background. In my house, we don't scream, we don't shout, and there's no aggression at all. She doesn't know I'm aggressive. She knows I used to be. She's never seen me act up. Um, she's never seen me come through the door in a bad mood. Um, right. She, kn- I can offer this woman something because of all the changes I've made in my, uh, in my life and my journey. Um, I tell her about how I used to be and how I would be if she had said that five, well, ten years ago. And it's actually I've seen the impossible made possible. Um, the biggest thing I had to do. Have you still got time? No, plenty of time. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Open yeah. format. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, the biggest thing, the biggest accomplishment I think in this recovery thing for me was letting go of resentment. Right. Um, because I was full of resentment. I hated the world. I hated the bullies. I hated my mother. I hated the system. I hated the government. I hated schools. I hated churches. I mean, there was nothing I didn't hate. And I, as, while I'm hating, it's just going to give me someone to blame. So um, I started working on, on the steps. And when you get to step four, you start working on your resentments. And look, it's not easy. But um, we have to take a look at ourselves and then resentment we've caused others. And I realized how much hurt I've caused others. You know? And if I'm holding on to the pain that others have caused me, what about those poor people I've harmed? You know? Right. Um, I need to let go. And I thought, because they told me I need to for do this forgiveness thing. And for me, that wasn't an option because I'm not going to forgive you when your behavior is horrific. When your behavior yes. is just How can I forgive someone who beat me black and blue? And then it was explained to me that I'm not, I'm not saying what they did was okay. What I'm, what I'm doing is I'm choosing to let it go so it doesn't keep me prisoner anymore. Because when I set a prisoner free, no, when I forgive, I set a prisoner free only to find the prisoner was me. Yep, absolutely. Me, I was a prisoner for many years of this. You don't I, have to um, carry those bags around with you anymore. I thought you I put that you can put it down, and we're carrying everybody's stuff all the time. And that's why we're so exhausted all the time. I thought that's I could, you, yeah. but anyway, yeah. mm. I, and then I put that down, and I, I started getting better with that. I let go of what the bullies did. You know, mm. those guys hurt me thirty years ago, forty years ago. If they're still bothering me now, it was one hell of a punch. You broke my nose yes. for thirty years. You're holding me prisoner while you windsurfing in the Bahamas, having a nice ice cold beer because you can have one, and when you're not giving me a second thought, you're still keeping me prisoner. So I let go because I know I can't unsee the horrors that I've seen. I can't undo the beatings. I can't unhear all those unkind words. Um, but all those things um, from yesterday were stealing my tomorrow. And now tomorrow, because I've let go, tomorrow is whatever I choose it to be. If I want to take the bag with me, I'm going to have a bad day. Um, I forgave my mother. I've met... The Cubans and there are some of the Russians we fought against in Angola. I've met them. Right. We've shaken hands. We've sure. had, wow. We've had... Um, How was that? That's been amazing. They welcomed us back to Angola with open arms to go to the battle sites. We, we not heroes there, but we're friends. They have a site there which we were supposed to go to in March at Twitter Carnival where the last battles took place. Yeah. They had a red carpet for us to come and join them in a church service to come and mourn for both sides of the losses they very you know it's, it's if i didn't let go of that because i mean i lost friends there friends lost limbs there. We, we we don't have that drama anymore my mom um i didn't let it back into my space when i forgave her because i didn't have to you yes. know what i mean um but i did forgive her she passed away quite a few years ago now and you know she used to work for lifeline a while back when she was still in Botswana, she worked for Lifeline. I didn't think this was a good idea because how dare you work for Lifeline and go and help all those people when you did this to me. You got double standard, you're two-faced and stuff you. Um, I got letters after she died through her boyfriend from people at Lifeline, from Lifeline, people that said to her, thank you for changing my life. Thank you for saving my marriage. Thank you for saving my relationship. Thank you for saving my life even. Right. It was a letter from Lifeline Gabaron. Thank you for founding Lifeline Gabaron. She was a founder member. Now, I had the privilege of, in the fellowships, being able to sponsor and mentor many people. I've heard the same thing. I've had the privilege of hearing, thank you for saving my life. Yeah. Because of passing on the message that I had. I've had the privilege of hearing, so thank you. My, marriage, my wife is back with me and we've worked things out and getting through. I've had the privilege of opening meetings, starting them from scratch. And I realized that she went on her own journey and she did some incredible things. She turned her life around. She managed to help others. And um, I actually wish she was kind of around so that I could ask her about the stuff. She did some incredible, she's an elephant whisperer. I didn't know that. You know, wild right. elephant. I've got a picture of her hugging a wild elephant. She just did some incredible things. But because I didn't let it back in my space, I never found out. Um, I've forgiven her, and I have such a, I'm not a higher power guy, I don't believe, um, 
uh, uh, supreme beings or anything like that. My higher power in this program of, of ours is other people in the program kind of thing right. and sponsors and meetings. But um, so, um, I had a point to make. Um, oh, yes, so last year, I proposed to my missus. Right. I had the proposal went very badly. I wasn't very good at it. I'm doing better now on, on radio than I did in my bedroom. I was so nervous. Okay. And um, <laughs> she, anyway, she accepted the proposal and she thought I wasn't such a bad guy. And um, the first thing I wanted to do was pick up the phone and phone my mom and tell her I'm getting married. Mm. And that's a far cry from wanting to shoot her in the face many, many yes. years ago. I didn't, when I got married before, I didn't invite her to the wedding, so I didn't tell her I was getting married. The amount of hatred I had for was second to none. I got married on the 7th of September last year, which happened to be her birthday. I chose the day. Right. It was a Saturday. And I chose it so my mom could be part of this process. Sure. The fact that I have this peace with her and think she's an incredible, I have not just said I've forgiven her. She's part, there's a picture of her in my lounge. And right. not that I have any pictures of her. And I managed to let that go. And I managed to not take on any more, as many resentments as I used to. I still, they still build up, but I work on it. Right. I've got this thing called serenity. You know, I didn't know what that was. Like I said, you asked me how I was. I was hateful, angry, aggressive, violent, and just in angry. a lot of yeah, but in a lot of pain. Mm. That's all. You know, like to be to be scared, you react in ways that you you may not. Fear is anxiety, um, yeah. and, when, and when you're a child and you're afraid to go home, as you said, you because you don't know, you know, that your safe place doesn't exist. Mm. When the one person who's supposed to keep you safe is the one causing the most harm, mm. the, the, you don't have a way to process things, and you just live with anxiety all the time. And that anxiety comes out as anger, as rage, as I mean, it's, yeah, I understand the road rage thing completely. You know that that you talk about. I wanted to ask you, how, how has service been for you in terms service, of the pillar? Well, it's been a great pillar. So service is me helping others, me carrying the message to other people, the message I've got free that I can pass on to others and they can hopefully get what we've got and helps me keep what I've got. Um, service keeps, you, keeps me involved in a meeting, even if it was just washing cups after a meeting, the coffee cups, sponsoring someone, chairing a meeting. Um, like my buddy says, service is like peeing in your pants. Nobody else will notice, but it'll give you a nice warm feeling. And, and, <laughs> and this, you know, it gives me a reason. If I've got to pack out the chairs, it gives me a reason to go to the meeting. It connects me to the meeting. Um, it gives me a sense of responsibility. Um, the most important service I've ever done is having to sponsor and help other people in the program. Because this is a very, very serious thing. A lot of guys don't, might not take it seriously. You've got a guy's life in your head. And you give him one piece of bad advice, he's dead. Yeah. Because this program, you, we, we, we end up in coffins. It's not like you, you, you get divorced or anything. You just, you, we, we can die. Um, they say in, in our preamble, to drink is to die. Um, so service did two things for me. So when I, when I was here, I always wanted to service. I wanted to help. I must have collected hundreds of sponsees over the nine and a half years I've been sober. But after my first year, I sponsored everybody who asked. I had tons. I collected them. It was like my hobby. And it was so nice to be of service to the world. It was so nice to add value to other people's lives. It was absolutely awesome. I felt good about myself. I felt happy. I felt like I added value to the world. However, the problem there was that I was so busy with them that I forgot to look at me. Right. And it, was, and it fed. I'm codependent as well. So it fed my ego. So these guys are saying, James, thank you, thank you. You know, when you get thanked all the time like that, it's absolutely amazing. It did me a world of good. Yes. But also, I felt like I didn't have to work on myself. So I stopped working my own program for some time because I was getting my fix right. from this, uh, this love addiction kind of thing or this uh, affirmation addiction. So it did good. And eventually, you know, I kind of realized it without relapsing, thankfully, because I know a lot of people, when they don't focus on their own recovery, can relapse. And I slowed down. Um, the other service I did later on uh, was on a professional level. I got into the rehab game and halfway house game. I had a secondary care centre, I had a halfway house, um, a lot of sponsored beds. It wasn't for financial gain. Yes. Um, I've been involved with a lot of people in recovery. Um, it's helped. Uh, it's just helped me know I add value. 
you know. But it's important. Mm. Service doesn't just end in the fellowship with the addict and the alcoholic. Service happens at home as well. There's no use me running around saving all the alcoholics in the world and then I'm neglecting my responsibilities at home or as, as a father. Yes. So service for me is, I've got to, if we're not giving back, it's just not fair, you know. Um, That's it. Yeah. it you know, it, it, you, you spoke earlier about uh, being in restaurants and stuff and getting bad service from people and, and getting angry. You know, service is also how we deal with the world. Uh, yeah. Because it, it's who we want to represent. Now, if you could have, when you were sort of in the in the darkest, the pit um, of using, you know, have imagined then that you know your your the difference you would be making in people's lives. Now, is it something that you could have even believed? No, yeah. I, I had, I, I did have illusions of it once when I took some magic mushrooms. Right. Uh, I had a girlfriend that loved this stuff and she actually ended up in, she nearly died from it. Um, she used to give me the stuff and, and under the influence of that, um, she told me that I was this angel of something and that I'm God's right hand and I can do this. And I, and I, but I was under the influence when I felt that. I didn't think I could add value to anybody. Nobody would ask me advice. If anything, they would stay away from me. Right. I had people warn people about me. So there was no ways. First of all, I didn't think I had anything to offer. So I didn't think I was capable of helping the world. I first had to sort my own self out before I added value to somebody else. You can't pour from an empty cup, as they say. Absolutely. So I had no idea that I would be sitting in this chair one day. Mm. And when I went to my first meeting, and I'd be sitting nearly 10 years sober with a wonderful wife, kids. I have everything. I don't have a lot financially. I'm okay. I've mm. managed to recover from my yeah. two bedroom building I had when I clean up, I've got a house, I've got a car, um, I've got all I need. And um, it's, you know, it seems impossible now that you ask, could I have seen myself here? No. What, what would but you have seen? Yeah. It's, so I think th this is what I've sort of learned and, and what I believe. You know, I believe we are the same people, but we just had to peel away all of those layers. We had to put all of those bags down. You know, we were, we were piled under these mountains of dirt. We had to dig away that dirt and that pain and those rocks to reveal who, who we are inside. Otherwise, we would have just stayed in that dark place. Um, we grow and evolve. But I think what I've seen in the rooms and meeting people, meeting guys in recovery, it's they're, they're, they are good people who carry a tremendous amount of pain. And no one taught us how to deal with our pain. No one taught us. We, we, there was no nurturing, love, care. You know, there, there might have been elements of love from, the, but it was it was a lot of pain, and there was no safety. And you don't get taught. Um, you know, it's one of my my favorite quotes from uh, George, Irish George. And he says, "It's your best thinking that got you here, and that's it. It's our best thinking that we use." But now we have that. If you met your pre your earlier self today. What would you say to yourself? What advice, advice counsel? What, what, what's the first thing that you would you give yourself a hug? You know, what's the first thing that you would, you, you would do? Uh, it's a very, I know what I would do as new James and what I do when I see people like myself. But I yeah. have to take into account what my old self was like. Yeah. So if this James goes to that James and says, my brother, everything's going to be okay. Come here and give me a hug. Old James is going to knock him out. So I need... Yeah. I need to be very clever when I approach my old self or somebody mm. like me and just smile, shake the hand and just let them know that you're there and that they, right. might, that they mean something to this world. Let them feel like they mean something. Hello, my brother. Nice to see you. Smile at them. Yeah. And that's what I, what I like to do. I've always been like that. Um, you know, I go to the shop, I smile at people. I try and connect with human beings as often as I can. I've got my little car. I moved to Edenville two years ago and I hated it because I knew no, nobody. Now I can't right. go to a coffee shop. Without a hundred people coming to sit and talk, my wife's been here for her whole life, and she doesn't know a quarter of the people I know because right. I like interacting with humans. And yeah. my old self would have liked a bit of that because I was lonely in a bar. I was lonely when I was using. I could have a hundred people around me and feel unimportant. I'd get interrupted mid-sentence. You know, I just no one gave me the time of the day. I was never the guy that got invited anywhere. So my new self would probably invite my old self 
got a bright or just let them feel like they noticed. Right. That's awesome. Huh? Sure. That's fantastic, man. So you were saying the book is out, the book is out in November. That's right. Your my sobriety date is the 15th of November. Okay. Awesome. Uh, actually, I, uh, uh, six, no, nearly a year ago, I got the serenity mm. prayer, which we use in AA and NA. Yes. Serenity prayer with a wolf and everything tattooed on my arm with my sobriety date. I waited many years to do it because we don't, right. we can't ever think we've beaten this thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I thought after, at that stage, um, after so long, I'd, I'd put the date on. My son had the same tattoo, but with a Bible verse. Right. And it looks exactly the same, so we've got this bond now, which uh, which means a lot as well. But yeah, so it's on my arm. I try and remember to use it as often as possible. And right. yeah. uh, the date, so the book will be out on the on around around that date. We should be finished with it in the next couple of months, though. Okay. How how do people get hold of it? Well, again, I can give you an email address. Perfect. If you can. Uh, that's what we have for now because nothing's yep. been set. All of the, the, we still busy yep. at all the beginning. But my email address is james at championsrecovery.co.za. Fantastic. Um, if you are interested at all, please drop me a mail. I'll keep you on file. I'll make contact with you. And as soon as the book's published, I'll make sure that we, we post for okay. so, Awesome. I'll, I'll put your details down in the, in the description so that right. people will be able to access it. It's been, um, it's really been amazing having you on the show and listening to your story. Now, I've been, I've sort of been watching uh, over the years that we've been friends on Facebook, just the work and the service and the stuff that you do and uh, the people that you help, you know, and we're very fortunate that this is um, quite a close community, especially guys with a little bit more time behind them. And um, your, your name is always spoken of uh, very highly. And, uh, you know, our community is very fortunate to have you on board. And that's why I just wanted to get you here to just to share your story, because hopefully this gets out to someone that needs to hear it that's, that's not in a good place and that understands that it takes hard work. You know, the, the, everything that we have today is, is the self-love, the self-care, flipping hard work, you know, harder than anything else. But any day in sobriety is better than a day in active. You know, so, you know, it, it, it's really, it's meant a lot for me to have you here. And I'm very, very grateful that you, uh, you agreed to come on the show, James. Well, thank you for the kind words. So that's the kind of thing, like I said, you asked me what I'd say to my younger mm -hmm. self. Um, I would have never heard words like that had I not made these changes. What you just said about me. I listen to this and say, is he talking to me? Is that what I do? Do I do that thing? I am ready to die in the community. And yeah. that's all I can say to somebody else out there who's feeling like they're a monster, like they don't belong, or they're not part of the system, or they're just too far gone to get help. I was too far gone, I think. I thought I was. I thought I'd never change. And the fact that someone like you that I admire would say something that kind to me shows that the effort, it does work if you make the effort. So I appreciate that. Thank you. No, absolutely. And uh, I mean that seriously. I mean, I, you, you are someone that I looked up, up you, that I look up to in this program. Um, really, you know, it's, you're doing a lot of really good stuff. And uh, we are, we're very fortunate to have you in the community. Because it saves, it does, it saves lives. And it saves lives of good people. Because there, there are a lot of good people that haven't made it. And yeah. uh, for stuff that they're not known how to deal with. So that's, that's right. You know, I've, been to, I've been to more funerals in the fellowship that I did in for my Angola buddies. Yeah. Um, that's it. Just, yeah, it's, it, this is very serious and it's our lives and it's every, it, it's everyone that's using and drinking and people have to, you know, people have to understand there, there is a way out. There's a better way to live, but you're going to have to work your ass off face very dark things and and take response take your life back i think that's that's really what it's about eh? so yeah. yeah cool thanks my boy all right well thanks Appreciate for the invite it's great, it's great to see you even if it's only in 2d yeah 2d and uh, in pink and blue, <laughs> pink and blue. yeah oh, thanks again awesome. it was great to be here